Good morning, everybody. So glad to see all of you here today and really appreciate you being here on this beautiful Saturday. There are many other places I know you could be. Some people aren't here because they're in Salem, Virginia at our girls lacrosse playing in the state championship. Some people are at in Radford at the girls soccer team playing in the state championship. Some people are over at the Tenor Hill Blues Festival, so they're not here or the Farmer's Market or Kids Sports, or I think there's the Plain Air Festival today, too. So there's a lot going on at Falls Church, and we appreciate that you chose to spend your Saturday morning here with us. Uh, there's a lot going on outside of today, too. So we're going to get into this as quickly as we can with the aim of getting, every, get, getting done all the presentations by 1030, uh, some Q&A between 1030 and 11, and then we'll be around between 11 and 1130 if you have further questions. So I am Mary Beth Connolly. I'm the Vice Mayor of Falls Church. Mayor David Tarter asked me to extend his greetings. He's not able to be here today. He's at his college reunion, but he is very involved in this project and is really looking forward to hearing the feedback that you give us today. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Lawrence Webb, who is the Chairman of the School Board. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, as uh, the Vice Mayor said, I want to thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, it is a beautiful Saturday morning, and I appreciate you giving us a little a little time this morning to, to hear about an exciting project that we have going on. Uh, it has been a long time coming. Um, I think we have some great options for you to hear about today, uh, to see what the work has gone on over the last, essentially about two and a half years now, of working with different consulting groups, bringing in folks now with Perkins Eastman to do some test fitting and giving us some designs of what uh, the high school of the future can look like. And I think I can say from both sides, from the school board as well as the city council, we're excited about where we are. We know we still have a long way to go on the financing piece of it, uh, but we want you, the citizens of Falls Church, to take the opportunity to look at these options Give us your feedback because ultimately your kids are gonna be the folks who are gonna be going to these brand new schools. And we wanna make sure that you have a say in what they look like, what the designs of them will be. And also you're gonna be the folks who are helping to fund these brand new schools. And we want to make sure that you have a say in what your ultimate tax bill is gonna be and what you're willing to, to spend on these brand new projects. Um, but I wanna thank you again for being here this morning. Um, Exciting time for us as we look forward to this new high school and look forward to your feedback today. Thank you. Just some quick housekeeping details. There's water over there and food and coffee. Help yourself throughout the morning. The restrooms are right out this door if you need those. And we want to just make sure everybody's signed in. There was a sign in back here and a sign in there just so that we have your email so we can keep you updated on what's happening. Everybody should have gotten an index card when you came in. So if you think of questions as we go along, please write them down. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce some other city council and school board members who are here today. So they are, here is David Snyder, Letty Hardy, Bill Duncan, Karen Oliver sitting down. And from the school board, we have Lawrence Webb, Phil Reitinger. Is that it? That's it for now. A few others may be arriving later. So my role here for the next 10 minutes is just to catch everybody up on the history of this piece of land and where we started and where we hope we're going. This is the map of where we are. And you can see George Mason High School, Mary Ellen Henderson, the field at the top. So way back in the 1950s, shortly after Falls Church became a city, uh, there was a group of visionary citizens who decided to buy this piece of land. They had a lot of money and they actually considered buying Lake Barcroft. Luckily for us, they bought this piece of land and they put our high school on it and it opened in 1953 and it became the high school campus. Uh, and we've used it really well for the last 60 years. Uh, back in the early 2000s, there was a, people realized that we were going to have to do something with George Mason High School because it was getting old. And there was a whole facilities evaluation committee. Is anybody here who was on that committee in the early 2000s? Well, one person, Cindy was. Uh, and that was a, they really went through all the possibilities. But at the time, we owned this piece of land in Falls Church, but it was 
in Fairfax County. So Fairfax County had the zoning control over the piece of land. So when we, when we built this high school in 2003 and 2004, we had to go to the Fairfax County Planning Commission and get permission to build what we wanted to build on this middle, for this middle school. And one of the examples that I always use on this is that the gym, which is over on the other side, is submerged uh, underground, half of it's underground. We wanted to build it taller, but the Fairfax County Planning Commission said we had to put it underground. So we were subject to what the Planning Commission said and we had to do that. So in 2013, Falls Church, there was a referendum and we voted to sell our water system to Fairfax County Water and we got the school land became part of the city of Falls Church and we also had some money to start to build do the next project. So now we have the land in 2013. Who voted in that referendum and voted? Thank you for that vote. That was really important. So now that we own the land and zone the land in 2013, we were able to decide our own destiny. But that was four years ago and it's taken a long time to get to this point. And I keep wondering what is taking, why is this taking so long? And I think as everyone knows, it's a really complex project because we're trying to put in 10 acres of commercial development. It's expensive to build a new school. And we have all the kids that are here now. We have to figure out how we're gonna educate them while we're doing the project. So in 2014, we had the Urban Land Institute come in and they did a technical assistance panel, a TAP. Did anybody participate in that one? That was over at the Hilton Garden Inn. And they, they brought in experts in commercial development, architects, uh, all sorts of different people spent 24 hours reviewing the whole site and they gave us this great report. It's on the city website. And they told us, yes, you can do that. You can put 10 acres of commercial development. You can have a school on there and you'll probably be able to pay for it, but there's gonna be a gap because you have to build the school before the commercial development can take place. So that was really conceptual. It was a great start and it made us feel really positive that we'd be able to go forward. In June, 2015, we had a meeting in this room, the first of many meetings in this room about the school, and Cooper Carey was here and we did a whole visioning on what we all envisioned for this site. And we heard from a lot of people about what they wanted in the school and what they wanted in commercial development. And that study is also up there on the website. And then in October, 2015, we did a community vision specifically about the school. What do people want in the school? What does a school of the 21st century look like? What do we need to be able to educate our students to the best of our ability. And then in February, we did a big present, oh, let me back up a second. Before February, uh, we did a PPEA, which is a public-private, education. public-private education and infrastructure act. We put out an RFP and we asked developers if they could come up with a way to give us 10 acres of commercial development at a school. We got two responses to that, and that was all closed, and a lot of people in the community were frustrated because they couldn't see what was going on. And we looked at those proposals and said they were pretty good, but we really wanted to open the process up so everybody would be able to have some input into how this is gonna work. So then, last summer, we started another process and we brought in a company called Link, and they helped us really nail down exactly how big of a school we wanted, uh, how much it was going to cost, what was affordable, what were the enrollment projections for the future. And then in February, we did a presentation. And I usually bring some uh, props when I talk, but this is my props from the last one. And I said, we left no stone unturned. We looked at the history of the site. We looked at what we could do to build new. We looked at what we could do to renovate. And we came up with some great solutions. Um, again, none of them are perfect, and there's lots of back and forth and decisions that have to be made. So once we got through that one, then we put out an RFP and we hired Perkins Eastman, who are here today. And what, the reason I didn't bring any props today is because Perkins Eastman has all the good stuff right here. And they did a study and they looked at what is feasible on this site and they came up with some great options. So they're gonna speak after Dr. Noonan and give you all those options and I know you're waiting for the big reveal. So that is all I have and here's Dr. Noonan. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for being here. My name is Peter Noonan, and I'm the new uh, superintendent of schools here in the city of Falls Church. And uh, I always like to preface my remarks with how long I've been here. This is week four for me. So I appreciate your patience and your understanding as I sort of jump into this. Um, but with that newness of being here, I think one of the things that it um, affords me is a, sort of a unique 
opportunity to look at things through perhaps a, a different set of eyes. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to be jumping into this process with all of you and uh, hearing from the community. And I've been for the last four weeks sort of on a listening tour, if you will, and I've had a chance to talk with uh, our really great students, many of our community members, all of our principals, many of our teachers, um, and, and there are, and, and many of our city leaders as well. And there are some questions that I've been asking as I've gone through, and one of the main questions that I've asked is, who are we? Um, great organizations are able to very quickly define who we are um, as a system. And one of the things that I found in that question has been, we are a, a really great community of people who are very proud of their school system. And I don't know if they're saying that because I'm the school superintendent or not, but it's clear to me as I'm talking with lots and lots of different folks from very different points of view and very different perspectives that our brand here in the city of Falls Church is our schools. And for that, I, I'm very proud and, and proud to be here. Um, I have a couple of slides, and as Mary Beth uh, or Ms. Conley mentioned, you know, you're here really for the big reveal, so I'll try to go through my slides as quickly as possible. Um, one of the things that we are very excited about as we think about um, the, the possibilities of a new school is really allowing our teachers and our students to engage in a 21st century education uh, in a 21st century school building. And by the way, we're 17 years into the 21st century, so we better sort of like get on with it, right? Um, we, we know that our kids are, uh, are, are extraordinary and our teachers are extraordinary and what happens in our schools are amazing. Um, but we do see, or I do see, as I walk into this with a fresh set of eyes, a true gap between the quality of our teachers, the quality of our students, and our facilities. And so I'm very excited about the possibility of closing that gap and really allowing our facilities to meet the needs and match the quality of what's happening in our classrooms. What we know is that high quality schools correlates, school buildings correlates to high quality outcomes. Um, and that can be academic outcomes, um, it can be health outcomes, it can be happiness outcomes, and it can be space planning. So, when I think about academic outcomes, one of the things that we talk a lot about is what does the space look like in our schools, for example, in science, in science labs? Do we have the space to be able to maneuver and to be able to utilize um, science labs as well as they can be? Do we have really great technology spaces? Do we have the appropriate space for equipment that needs to come in to really give our students an opportunity to engage with those tools necessary to meet the skills required for the 21st century? We have really great spaces for collaborative, uh, flexible spaces for collaboration between and among kids. And I would submit to you that in that academic, academic realm, we're falling very, very short. Um, health, we, we have some issues of air quality in our, in our buildings that we need to take care of. Um, one of the things that I had the unique opportunity of doing last week is talking with a group of high school leaders from George Mason. And I said, what's the one thing that you wish could happen into the future um, here to, to really improve the quality of education. And they, you know, it was the weirdest answer I think I possibly could have ever gotten, but they said, can you make it stop raining inside of the building? And I, I said, what do you mean? And they said, we walk down the senior hallway and if it's raining outside, we just get drenched as we walk along. So there are some real health issues that are associated with this um, building as well. Um, and space planning uh, is equally an uh, issue. Um, so the school board and the superintendent, quite frankly, is absolutely committed to assessing what does our space look like from pre-K all the way up to 12. And we've had a lot of conversations and looked at from a comprehensive perspective, what are the needs that we have in all of our schools so that we can continue to provide high quality programs for our kids. And as I think about it, I'm sort of backtracking just a little in terms of the academic program. I've, I've been trying to come up with the right analogy that might actually work to sort of help drive home the fact that um, the space issues that we have in our schools are really problematic. And I, the best one I can come up with, and perhaps it'll fall apart as you think about it a little bit more, but I'll give it the best uh, shot I can, is I love to cook. Um, and one of the things that I love about my house is I have a nice big kitchen with a lot of space, with the right tools, with the right flow, with the right opportunity to be able to create. Um, I didn't have that when I moved into the house originally. I had to go through a process to really make it what it was, but I started with a really tiny kitchen that had no flow, I didn't have the right tools, I wasn't able to um, appropriately utilize the space. And I was able to create then ultimately a pretty good outcome, um, at least I, I would say it was a pretty good outcome, um, with the food that I was able to prepare in that small space, but it was frustrating and it was difficult. 
And when you have the appropriate space in a building, and that analogy, by the way, is the kitchen to the classroom, you're able to, uh, if that wasn't clear, um, you're able to really do the things that you want to do. So we know that there are some risks um, in doing this project. And obviously, some of the risks are associated with the economics of it. Um, but we know not doing this project perhaps holds even more risk for us. Um, the quality of the teachers in our classrooms matter. And without a doubt, that adult that stands in front of those kids every single day has the single most impact on the outcomes of the students that they serve. Unfortunately, um, we are now starting to see teachers leaving Falls Church City Schools because of the quality of our buildings. Um, we actually have had a teacher who wrote a, a very eloquent letter um, saying that she can no longer teach in the space that she's teaching in and she's gonna move on to another school district. To the extent that we have some issues nationally around teacher recruitment and teacher retention, I think we are at a significant risk of being able to attract and retain the, the highest quality of teachers to be able to put in front of our kids uh, because quite honestly our, our, our facilities just don't match um, what our surrounding jurisdictions have with respect to classroom spaces. Um, and I would suggest that in, in many ways it's a national crisis around teacher recruitment and teacher retention, um, but we could feel an immediate risk here if we aren't able to attract the best and brightest. Um, so in my, in my humble opinion, as, as I enter into the system um, for after four weeks, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is the loss of our brand and the loss of our, uh, what makes us great as a city is our schools. And I think that in the absence of really doing something, um, we have a pretty great risk of, of losing what makes us great. So I'm personally very excited about this project. Um, I know that there are some details that need to be worked out, um, but rest assured, if we can get through those details, uh, you, can, you can rest assured that we are gonna have one continued product here in the city of Falls Church that is better than what it is today, and we are already pretty good. So I'm excited to be here, and at this point in time, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Perkins Eastman, who are here to present um, the variety of options that they've come up with. And they've been great partners, by the way. So, Sean and Andrea, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, it's, it's a great honor to work in a, in a place that you know, can talk so eloquently about the impact of facilities. I mean, we're architects, we have to believe that the environment has a, a, an impact on education. But I think, as Dr. Newton just stated, um, the, the building truly contributes to education. You, there's this idea of uh, net zero energy that some of you may have heard about. It's an idea that the building can generate a lot of power, you know, and perhaps compensate for the power that it's consuming and end up with sort of this neutral area. Um, we like to actually take that uh, analogy of net zero energy and then think about what if the, we focus on net positive education and really design to create a facility that enhance those educational outcomes that Dr. Noonan was talking about. That said, I'm Sean O'Donnell with Perkins Eastman. This is Andrea Shaw, my uh, partner. Um, we're going to tag team uh, the presentation here and uh, hopefully uh, share a lot of the thinking that's gone in uh, working with the committee here and, and the school board and the city council to really you know, explore all of the options to, to create that great 21st century learning environment. And as Dr. Noonan said, you know, we're thinking about a building that'll last you know, 60, 70, 80 years here too. So it, it'll make the 22nd century potentially. So uh, this is a real investment in the future of the community. Um, so this is our agenda. You know, we like a lot of slides. We've got a lot to share. We're going to go through some of them pretty quickly, though. Um, but uh, the first thing that we did is uh, really think about what kind of process should we use here. And we call it the three-step process. So it's creative analysis, options, and preferred option. And the first part is actually the key to the success of the latter two. And that's really where we explore what are the issues here? What are we trying to do? What are the constraints? What are the opportunities? And so we're going to talk a bit about those um, because, again, they lay the groundwork for the options that we'll talk about as well. And they become the filter in many ways for evaluating those options and why you would select one over the other. Um, so we've gone through this process and we're now at that preferred option stage and we'll share the options with you and then uh, the next step is to actually select one or two to, to move on, to advance from this point in time. 
So the first thing that we did in a workshop format with the committee was you know, try to establish again, what are the learning goals? And there's been a lot of conversation over the various reports and committees. Um, but again, making sure that we're focusing on creating that great learning environment and what does that mean um, for uh, George Mason and for the district itself and for the city. So th focusing, of course, on the excellence in the academic program. Uh, personal aside, I, when we started thinking about the high school, um, we were so impressed. I said to my wife, why, why aren't our sons going to this high school? You know, my youngest son in particular would thrive in here. Um, there's some amazing programs going on, you know, but again, I'm not sure that the facility is, is accommodating them quite as well as it could be. So that's what we're after. But then we talked a lot about, you know, expansion of the middle school that we're in. How does that happen? Um, how do we deal with, uh, you know, this idea of uh, continuing the evolution of education and technology over time, you know, to make sure that, you know, the building can handle change, you know, that's happening very quickly, you know, in our day and age in education. But also that, you know, we're, we're not just creating a building that's not sitting in isolation. It's relating to the context. It's relating to this larger idea of the development of the campus, the mixed use properties. But it's also uh, integrating into Paul's Church, which is this wonderful, walkable, you know, urban, you know, uh, small city. So you know, it's it's got to be part of that larger vision and engage into that. And that raises a lot of issues of how the community can use the facility and even how you get to the campus successfully. So um, again, you know, thinking about that history of education, that the city and, and education really are one. You know, there's not this separation of ideas. But then uh, also starting to think about uh, you know, some of the challenges of implementing a project here. We have a lot of activity on the campus. We have to think about how this is phased and staged successfully. Um, and that implementation and, and of course, budgets are, are of critical importance to the feasibility of the project. So a few other opportunities came up in, in that conversation as well. One is that we can really create something that suggests you know, lifelong learning or a continuum of education. I mean, we've got Virginia Tech and UVA right next door. Um, you know, so we can think about you know, children entering the system as a pre-K student and then perhaps even you know, going straight to graduate school in, in the environment that we can foster on the campus at this point. Um, so some of the challenges again are, again, you know, like we talked about, you know, phasing cost that the mixed use development is, is uh, behind the construction of the school. So there's asynchronous funding. And then, you know, what does it mean to, to deal with the enrollment growth as we go forward? So what we wanted to do is, is just share uh, a little bit of the benchmarking that we've done too. Uh, we stepped back and looked at all the surrounding jurisdictions just to make sure that you know, we're building an appropriate facility that's comparable to your peers. We're not overbuilding, um, and you know how does that compare with respect to some of uh, uh, your peer facilities? Hi, and so this is a slide showing you some of the uh, enrollment projections that we were looking at. So we are designing a school for 1,200 students, but that has the flex capacity to um, house 1,500 students. And so looking at the projections about 10 years from now, we're close to 1,200. Uh, and then we uh, approach 1,500 students kind of far further away. Um, and the middle school as well will also experience increased enrollment. And then so as Sean started to say, we looked at uh, peer districts in the region. So we looked at Montgomery County, DC, Arlington, and Fairfax counties, and we evaluated their ed specs against the Falls Church ed specs to make sure that we're building uh, the right size high school and providing the spaces that we see uh, the neighboring areas providing in their schools. So the text that's in black on the left side are the um, is the data that we were designing around the amount of students and uh, amounts of classrooms and such. Uh, and so far in the designs that you'll see today, we are proceeding with what was in the ed spec, except for the uh, parking spaces, the reduction from 400 to 300 parking spaces, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, there's also uh, some of the analysis we did with the benchmarking that we will show you later when we're looking at possible cost savings as well. And so we also not only looked at what's in the building, but we looked at 
uh, what's outside of the building because we're looking at reducing the 34 acres to possibly 28 or 24 acres we wanted to see what that would mean in terms of the parking and the fields and the footprints of the building so this is the existing site we're outlining the fields and the parking related to the high school um, and we compared that to about 10 other school school systems um, schools that we thought were good programs and that uh, that varied in size from the kind of campus that currently is George Mason to sort of the extreme end, which would be a campus in you know, Manhattan or Chicago. We wanted to get the full range of what exists. Uh, so the bar on the left side is George Mason High School existing with the 34 acres, um, the field use in orange, the, the footprint of the building, four acres, and the parking footprint, 2.8 acres and compare that across the board. And what we realize is that if we're gonna reduce the size of the lot from 34 to 24 acres, then where we wanna look for a comparison is really where you're seeing the arrow pointing at a school like Yorktown High School or Bethesda Chevy Chase High School that has a smaller site, right, around 20, 22 acres. And that means that the footprint of the building needs to reduce to probably around two, two and a half acres. So we're starting to talk about a building that's more than one or two floors, but possibly four or five floors. Uh, and that the size of the parking footprint on the site would need to be reduced as well. And Sean will talk about the site. So um, again, Raising other issues and thinking about you know what happens with the site as it becomes more integrated into the city and other opportunities to think more broadly about it. One of the questions is how do you get there, um, and how can we make that as as amenable a process as possible? Um, so uh, this is a typical sort of an analysis that we do uh, from an urban design standpoint. Is you know what's a convenient walk, I mean, and quite often you know five ten minutes are easy walks. A 20-minute walk, which is uh, this outline here, um, is, is still viewable, and this is about 30 minutes to the center of town. Um, but it also starts to think uh, suggest that, you know, how do we deal with buses and other modes of transport that are available? Your bus zone is shown in the red here. Um, Arlington's is actually at this uh, uh, 1.5 mile mark, which is about halfway through the city, a little uh, further than that. So I think uh, the other piece that we've also looked at is, I don't know if there's a, what's? Yeah, there is, it's the middle button. Uh, okay, that's the middle button. Yeah. Okay, here's a laser. <laughs> um, so here's 1.5. This is where Arlington would start busing children. So these children would be bused to the campus. These children would walk or bike. Um, so on that idea, we took, uh, you know, from end to end of the city, it's about two and a half miles. That's about a 15 mile bike, a 15 minute bike ride. Um, so my bike's outside, um, you know, anybody that wants to bike with me afterwards, uh, you know, and, and, and prove the point, um, I'd be glad to, I'm, I'm going that way anyway. Um, but again, I think we've got a real opportunity to take advantage of such a great walkable environment, you know, or bikeable environment to suggest that maybe there's a, a way that we can get to this campus um, that's much more uh, amenable. You know, I came in around here and through the parking lots and, you know, it just, Right now, it doesn't feel you know, quite comfortable to do that. Uh, frankly, it's the worst part of the ride uh, coming in this morning. Um, so you know, maybe there's a nicer way to connect to the surrounding context. We know there's development coming here and here in the future. There's also likely development coming here um, and around the metro station. This is a beautifully transit-oriented site. It, of all the high schools that we looked at, it is by far the most transit-oriented site. I know if you think about Yorktown, the metro's you know, miles from Yorktown, right? Um, so, uh, you know, here we can make all these great connections that allow people to walk onto this campus, I think, beautifully and uh, really engage the environment as successfully as everything else that's happening uh, down Route 7. Um, that said, you know, the analysis of the site suggests that, you know, here we have that sort of urban, you know, connectivity side. We sort of have a back here, you know, defined by 66 here as well but we'll have further linkages crossing you know, in the future too. So this starts to suggest you know, maybe the building wants to orient itself towards this integration with the city versus you know, uh, the sort of backside of the campus. With that, uh, we also again analyze the parking 
and Andrea will share some of that with you. Right, so this is looking at um, the count that we got existing use of the site. The high school uses 300 spaces, so we benchmarked against some of the other high schools we were looking at uh, in the region, that being Dunbar, Yorktown, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, and Wakefield. Um, so the numbers that you see in bold, the 300, the 237 with those vertical bars are the number of parking spaces at those <coughs> high schools. Um, the 0.25 numbers that you see with the varying uh, lighter or darker yellow is saying how many spaces per student. So what we currently have at, um, uh, sorry, at George Mason, if we look at it for 1,200 students, it's 0.25 spaces, and at 1,500, it's 0.2 spaces per student. Both of those numbers are higher than any of these other high schools. Um, they all have less spaces per student, and we are so, you know, so lucky to have a smaller community that you don't need to be driving so far from. Um, so what this told us is, is that, back to what I was saying earlier, the ed spec of providing 400 spaces, we felt that there was the ability to reduce it to 300 and even possibly further. So some of the other inputs um, are, you know, we believe very strongly in this idea of sustainable high performance learning environment. It gets to everything that Dr. Noonan was talking about. Yes, resource conservation is, is critically important, um, you know, in a school that we construct in this day and age. So energy and water conservation. Um, but we also believe that all the things that Dr. Noonan was talking about, air quality, acoustics, thermal comfort, um, you know, daylight and views, these are things that actually have demonstrable impact on educational outcomes. So we want to make sure that we're organizing the building, even at this very early stage, to take advantage of all these opportunities. Um, so, but we're, you know, the design process starts very sort of broad and high level, and then it works its way down, you know, from 30,000 feet to, you know, zero. Uh, so we're right here right now thinking about program, orientation, the location of the building, and trying to lay the groundwork to create a, a great high performance sustainable building. So we're going to talk a little bit about orientation, but I know there's lots of interest in geothermal systems and other things. What we're trying to do is, is provide the opportunity for all those decisions to be made uh, as the design process continues and we think about systems and materials as the process goes forward from here. So again, not precluding opportunities, but thinking about the big opportunities right now. And one of those big opportunities is simply to orient the building properly. Um, and so you're gonna look at these options and you're gonna see part of the building cranked and you're gonna say, that looks a little unusual. The grid goes like this and the building goes like this. Why is that? Um, it's because it's trying to orient itself properly to the sun. So this is the proper orientation in our location here off of you know, sort of the horizontal uh, of east-west. Uh, so we have a southern facade, a large southern facade, and a large northern facade. This does two things for us if we orient the building properly. One, it reduces the heat gain on the building and the solar impact on it. So less air conditioning, smaller air conditioning system, less operational cost. And you can see they can save typically up to 7%, sometimes a little more than that, um, simply if you get that orientation right. So it costs you less to operate the building over time. And it doesn't cost you anything just to swing the building a little bit around properly. The other thing it does, though, is allows us to control the daylight into the instructional spaces so that there's not a lot of glare, that, but we can still use the daylight as the preponderant way of illuminating the classroom. Um, there's a lot of research about the impact of daylight on education. Um, so we will get a dual bang for the buck when we, we try to organize the building simply uh, relative to the sun. The other sustainable goals, though, that we wanted to put forward um, at this important strategic time, again, is orient the building right, you know, get the daylight going, think about views, but then start to think about the building as a teaching tool as well, and that you've, you've got great science and technology programs. Uh, the IB has design tech programs. Um, why not you know, use the building as a teaching tool? But then also at this strategic moment, think about alternate modes of transportation again. You know, if you're thinking about carbon impact, um, you know, walking and biking and transit are, are certainly you know, have much greater value. But then lay the groundwork for those re renewable resources, photovoltaics, geothermal systems that come on here. Um, all these things make good economic sense in many ways as you go forward onto the site. Um, a few other 
points on the site as well. Again, thinking about the impact of each of the options on the mixed use development. So just a sort of simple diagram taking, you know, uh, you know, sort of the transaction between the mixed use portion, potentially here in the red. And yes, there was an assumption made that this intersection has great economic value. Um, yeah, this is generated even straight from the ULI study um, that you know, potentially the retail opportunities along this intersection of Haycock and Seven are, are good. So the focus is here, but you know, how much can we provide back for that transaction to help uh, 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 ensure that the financial circumstance works out for our project is, is what we're doing. So we're almost to the options. Bear with me uh, for just a few more minutes. Um, but again, thinking about what is a great 21st century learning environment, and we wanted to write this down before we started drawing, so it became the filter uh, for analyzing the, the options. So some of these things have real impact at this point in time. Um, so the idea of creating a heart of the school, really fostering a strong learning community in, in this building, creating an interdisciplinary set of neighborhoods within the building so that it scales, but then you have this great sort of interaction across the disciplines. The, the hybrid learning program here is, is, is truly 21st century. Um, we think that's gonna have a great impact as the building uh, goes forward. Um, so celebrating you know, all the 21st century things that you're doing and teaching and learning. Um, flexibility, we talked about, orientation of the building, professional workspace, and I'm not gonna read all these, but again, trying to lay the groundwork for creating something that is, is truly uh, fostering education is, is what we were after. But also thinking about, again, what, how does the building represent itself in the community and engage the community as well, and then invite the community in and thinking about that continuum of education. And then also, you know, how do you get here and, and what do you prioritize, uh, parking or program space if the site becomes, you know, a decision point of, you know, not enough surface area. But transportation demand management as a real opportunity to uh, change people's perception of, of how you need to arrive on the campus and what's an appropriate way. So, start the options conversation. Um, this is a, a diagram done by another firm on another study of what some of the mixed use might look like. You know, so here are four blocks around some green space. Um, and you'll, you'll see other variations on this theme as we go. But the, the grid of streets on this portion of the site makes a lot of sense. Um, so then the question is, you know, if we're to build a, a new building uh, for the high school here, um, it should have an appropriate civic uh, presence. We started to think about ideas of, you know, let's call it School Street. This is how you get there. You know, what if a front door could look something like this uh, into a high school? This is Dunbar High School in Washington. Um, that has a gracious front door and suggests, you know, something important is going on here. How, how could we achieve that? Um, but uh, with that grid of streets, one of the first options that we uh, explored, and this option didn't make it to the, the second round, but was a question of what if we actually put the building on sort of the, the least valued space you know, on the site? Um, this is where the buses are stored, uh, the mulch piles here. Um, yeah, there's, there's a variety of other sort of extraneous use going on here, right? Um, and to optimize you know, the fields and the outdoor activity space. Um, now, we looked at this in, in a number of different ways. There, there are geotechnical issues here. The gym here itself went to a deep foundation system. Um, we know that there's sort of a rubbish pile that was a legacy here too, so that creates problems potentially and cost factors. Um, so this, it was challenged a bit by that, and it was also feels a little disconnected, right, uh, from the bigger idea of this and this. Um, so uh, that, those were some of the reasons why this didn't advance. You also see that you know, we had some overlap of the outdoor fields, the multi-purpose field. Um, we, you'll see subsequent options where we push the, the 10 acre line back to truly a 10 acre line and, and pick up some additional space to accommodate that. And in the second option, and we tried to name these just to give them sort of a character and a sense of place. So this is the community school as it's called because it, because it pulled back into relationship uh, here. Um, what it does is it uh, creates a new high school here, uh, connected, you know, right out that door, uh, to uh, Mary Ellen Henderson. 
um, and allowing us potentially to share the kitchen that's right over here, uh, expand the kitchen and, and have a singular kitchen for the campus. So when we look for synergies you know, between them, uh, why have two kitchens, two staffs, uh, when you can have one? Um, you can have two separate dining rooms, so the one that we're in right now and maybe one right here. Um, but then to put the gym, the theater, and other things in a nice relationship to the fields and the outdoor space, the front door here at sort of the end of a new street that is on that alignment as you arrive uh, currently onto the site. So the front door is sort of on a nice axial relationship. Um, and then put all the fields around the building um, and then think about the multi-purpose field potentially as sort of a buffer between the, the development and the, our school. This is that 10 acre line. Um, so this is the, the 10 acres of, of development space uh, for the, the, the mixed use park. Um, so expansion of Mount Mary Ellen Henderson could go forward, a future pool here, um, and then the academic tower, which is on that solar orientation that we just talked about. So uh, all the classrooms, labs, and, and other instructional space typically uh, in that portion of the building. We overlaid that on the uh, existing site, just so you can see, here's the existing high school. Um, this uh, then is being built largely on the multi-purpose field. Uh, so it phases pretty cleanly, and we'll talk about that in a moment uh, you know, as, as one particular option. It also has a distinct identity for the high school and Mary Ellen Henderson retained. So you have connectivity sort of between them, um, but then you have distinct identities and entry points you know, for them. This is just a massing diagram of that, what it looks like. These are just big blocks placed on the development site. Um, you know, the buildings here would have more shape and potentially change size a little bit, but um, you know, just to give you an idea of that, you know, there would be buildings over here um, and that multi-purpose field between them and the, the campus and front door of the high school, front door of Mary Ellen Henderson, and the solar-oriented uh, academic wing, as we call it here, with the sort of shared uses of, you know, between the middle school and the high school program. And so for each of these options, you'll see that we have the site plan, the overlay, um, a massing image, and then we go through what we call our stacking diagram and our floor plans and phasing diagram. So the stacking diagram is if you were to cut a section through the building. So it helps you understand because as I talked about earlier, in order to get that footprint to about two, two and a half acres, we need to be more of a vertical campus than we are currently. Um, the, the middle school is three stories. We're looking at four to five stories for the high school. Um, so we have a common side of the school as Sean described, which includes the spaces that are used after hours. Um, in the summer, they can be available to the community. That includes the main gym, the aux gym, the theater, um, with their uh, related dressing rooms and locker rooms. And then we have the academic side of the building, which includes um, the, uh, the uh, additional performing arts and athletic spaces that may be more school-oriented, like your music rooms. Uh, and then as you go up in the building to the second floor, you have the guidance department and the um, yellow bar which is the library and the high c program and then above that floors three through five being the academic classrooms that are your more core classrooms of social studies and those kinds of spaces so what this is allows is there's a point in the building where you can separate it and say okay this side the common side is open and available after hours and the academic side is not you could also uh, lock the building off from floors three up and say the first flu first two floors of the building are available for the after hours use. And so these are very light, I apologize, but what you're seeing here are the first, second, and then three through five floor plans. So on the first floor, you come into a nice heart of the school that really is a big socialization space and pre-function space for auditorium and for uh, athletic events. And that connects, as Sean said, with the dining, uh, to that heart as well as the kitchen connection to the Mary Ellen Henderson kitchen uh, and the administrative offices when the students come in the building. And then up that gracious stair to the second floor, more access to the mezzanine for the auditorium, uh, possible like running track uh, suspended above the main gym and the aux gym spaces, and then three through five being academic. And so in terms of phasing, as Sean started saying, the uh, school is built entirely uh, on fields, not over the existing footprint of the building. So this allows as one phase to be the new school and the fields 
uh, reconstruction, and then the second phase, which you'll see in all of these, the piece that's here does not mean we're building the economic development. It means that we're demolishing the existing school and preparing that land for a developer to come in. So it's basically turning it into a, an empty piece of land that's flat and ready for somebody else to come in. So this schedule of total of two years and nine months uh, includes all that work. The two years and four months is what uh, was put forward as a schedule in the um, RFP that we responded to for construction of a new school. So the variation on the theme, the committee had asked us, what if we inverted the diagram and put the academic wing over here on, on the right side or you know, the sort of uh, southeast side of the building. So uh, you know, it, it's a similar idea of having that sort of shared commons facilities, gyms, theaters, and things between Mary Ellen Henderson. You know, the, the difference is that the academic wing is swung from here to there. Um, that changes the sort of dividing line for the 10 acre development here to be sort of L-shaped um, and creates a sort of different way of engagement with that space, you know, uh, entry plaza here, a front door into the, the new high school here. Um, again, shared loading, shared kitchen, um, you know, between the two buildings, optimizing those spaces um, and creating sort of a, a service court between the two buildings. But again, we've got distinct arrival points into the two programs. Um, and you know, what happens as well as the multi-purpose field moves from this area over you know, into sort of an integration with all the outdoor spaces. We've got nice indoor-outdoor relationships between the, you know, the gyms and where a future pool could be potentially as well uh, on the site. So, um, yeah, so, so this one uh, didn't make the cut, however, into the second round. Um, but we thought we'd share that with you. So the next option is, is a variation on that theme as well. However, the, the uh, commons building, as we're calling it, again, gym, theater, dining, um, has rotated over here um, to address the 10-acre line. Partly why that was, this one was inspired was by that sort of big boulevard that was drawn uh, by the other team in organizing this environment. So we thought, you know, what if the school took advantage of that sort of grand axis uh, to look at something um, that really represented the school well in that environment. The front door in this case for the high school would be here um, off its own entry plaza. And that, that's a sort of a design principle too, is that we don't like people just to spill out of the building onto the sidewalk, right? You want to spill out into a public space. It gives a little deep impression. Um, and so in each scheme, you'll see variations on that theme. Um, but then the academic wing connects to Mary Ellen Henderson in this scheme. So it's a different relationship. And we've heard a lot about what if middle school students wanted to take coursework in, in the high school. This, this kind of diagram would work very fluidly for that. Um, fields again are all here. Um, in each option, I haven't mentioned, you know, you'll see about 300 plus parking spaces organized on the site. Um, in many ways, trying to take advantage of this sort of curve uh, in many instances uh, and the, the sort of soils conditions that we find down there to, that can deal with the parking readily. But again, we're exceeding the 300 typically uh, uh, in each of these diagrams. So here's the overlay. Um, on the existing, you can see that that Commons building is sitting on one of the gyms and uh, also the A-Wing as it's called, so some of the sciences here. So it, it starts to drive a sort of phase solution or we can provide uh, sort of modular solutions to, to decamp this portion of the building, demolish it, and then maybe build it in one single phase. Um, so here's the massing of that. Uh, these are the gyms and the theaters, again, you know, sort of at the end of a, potentially a boulevard that's created or a park space um, on that side of the mixed use development. Here you see the academic wing. In this case, it's been broken in half and slid uh, to, to work around Mary Ellen Henderson uh, in this condition, but keep that optimal orientation in, in every instance uh, as we go forward. And so this diagram of that stacking, that section through the building, is similar to the one we showed you before. We were trying to, in each of these, adhere to the design principles that were developed, um, that there's a possible community use of the building as well. So the, uh, the performing arts and athletic uh, pieces are in the commons area, 
And then on the academic side is that part of the school with some dining, the second floor being the uh, library and high C program. So that could be open to more than just the high school students and the academics above. And so in the floor plan on the first floor, the athletics and the auditorium, and then the connection to the Mary Ellen kitchen with dining and admin on the second floor, more access to athletic and performing arts with the library and high C, and on the third floor, more arts and athletics, and in the academic side, three through five being the classrooms. And so as Sean mentioned, there's uh, two options for the phasing here. The first would be uh, that the academic piece and the fields are constructed as one phase, and then the commons piece is a second phase, and then the third phase is clearing the lands for economic development. The total for that time is three years and seven months, so it is almost a year longer than the community school. But the other option is, with the use of modular trailers, to account for the um, overlap of the new building and the existing building, that phase one and two are built at the same time and then we come back in and prepare it for economic development, which makes it a total of three years. So that saves seven months of construction. So our other challenge um, from our scope of work was a uh, question. Yeah, what if we save some of the existing building? And there are a lot of variations on the theme. Um, and so again, what happens is you know, we're, we're still trying to, to optimize you know, the land for mixed-use development. Um, that sort of dividing line is, is driven by you know, what we retain in the existing building. And uh, the, the big idea was you know, what if we kept the, the dining area, the Augs gym, the main gym, and the A-wing, which currently uh, houses sciences here, um, and then try to enhance that uh, with new construction. That moves that idea of School Street, the front door of the school, uh, over here to about a uh, six acre uh, mixed use development site. Um, and so we studied a couple of different options here. One that uh, you know, was put on the table was, you know, what if we just uh, created this piece or as, as sort of a uh, remnant of demolishing the existing school back to this point and then we built you know, something back here as a separate building. Um, I'm not gonna show you that option, partly because when you think about the, the design criteria that were established of creating a strong learning community, um, you know, enhancing the energy performance of the building, um, that option which tried to do as little as possible to this uh, building, you know, really keep the existing systems, keep the existing par partitioning, um, you know, try to avoid you know, bringing it up to a contemporary code, um, it really created sort of a very disparate environment within the, the existing building and then what would be built back here. So you'd have sort of 1960s here and you'd have you know, uh, 2020 here. Um, and so that option didn't advance forward. The ones that did um, were a more integrated solution of new construction shown in the white and the, the existing construction in the gray. So this you can call, for lack of a better name, the hybrid school. Um, and what it tried to do is, is to reconcile the, the ed spec here um, in the solu uh, you know, solution you know, utilizing this existing space, but it did compromise the ed spec and the other one does too, uh, to reduce the athletics program to just use the existing auxiliary gym, the main gym, and some of the ancillary space around that uh, existing facility, locker rooms, offices, and, and the like, partly to reduce the, the cost of the building, you know, was really the motivation of that. And it's, so it's, it's testing that theory of, of, you know, if we kept that piece, reduce the ed spec, you know, what's the ultimate cost of this uh, sort of solution? Front door is over here now, again, trying to relate to that sort of school street idea, civic presence. Um, we put the learning commons and high C over here, and then the preponderance of the academic uh, uh, portion over here. Um, the, the challenge of minimal impact on this is that your science program is down here. It starts to feel a little disconnected from some of the other programs, um, but we'll, so that's one reason that that solution didn't advance. We tried to solve that problem in this uh, solution by eroding you know, the A-wing off of the building, keeping the gyms, the dining uh, facility, and you know, what we're calling academic school here. 
Um, and then adding sort of the front door, the heart of the school, building off the dining here as well to create you know, sort of a sense of place as you come into the building, entry plaza, the academic uh, wing is, is now situated here over the A wing. Um, and then some of those common spaces, you know, again, are organized back here uh, relative towards some of the fields and the integration with Mary Ellen Henderson. Um, there's also opportunities though uh, because the, the, both of these modernization addition schemes try to minimize the EDSPEC athletic program in particular, um, I, where could the uh, expansion of, of the gym and athletics program go? Well, you know, this is a potential future expansion site for that uh, at when funding became available uh, down the line um, in a future pool uh, as well. So again, two different entrances still as you know, retained through each scheme. We do, however, have a separate loading area and a separate kitchen <coughs> for the scheme because we're retaining the existing. Um, so you know, the, we have a kitchen here and a kitchen here and a loading dock there and there. Uh, as this is another differentiator from uh, the scheme from the new buildings. An overlay here, um, it starts to show the, the little bit of the complexity of uh, you know, doing this. Um, so again, existing facilities that uh, will ultimately create sort of micro phases as we go forward here, and Andrea will talk about that in a moment. Here's the massing. So the academic wing is now here on, on Route 7. Uh, so nice presence of the building potentially on that solar orientation. Um, the entry point here, the learning commons, and then sort of the shared commons facilities between Mary Ellen Henderson and, and the new construction. You can see the existing building in gray at, at sort of the lower scale from the, the trying to optimize the vert verticality in the new construction. And so this uh, building and section looks very different than the others because it's got a larger footprint uh, due to the existing building being one story. So you see that very um, sort of pancake, uh, one floor of public spaces for the performing arts and the athletics program. And then when you get to the new academic bar on the first floor is the library and the high C program with some integrated visual arts on the second floor and then th third through fifth floors being the academic classrooms. So in plan, um, the plan on the left is the renovations and additions scope that we priced for this exercise, uh, where the gray is the existing building again, as Sean talked about, the existing kitchen and cafeteria with the heart, that's the main entrance, the administrative suite, and then the existing athletics piece. Uh, the new auditorium and performing arts edition over here, and then to this side is the academics edition. And the plan that you see on the right side, that's with the proposed future athletics expansion adding on here. Um, the negative is the sort of detachment of that new gym space from the existing athletics. And so the phasing is more complicated with this because it is being uh, built in multiple phases. The first would be to build the performing arts and the academics edition and fix the athletic fields. The second is renovate the existing building once you can move people out into the new pieces. And then the third is to add on that um, admin and dining edition on the east side. And then last is the demolishing uh, the rest of the building and preparing that for development. So this is a total of three years and nine months. So it's a year plus uh, some months longer than the community school that you saw first. So um, this may be a little difficult to read, but yeah. it's on the handout. Uh, yeah, so, um, and so the difference between the handout and what you're seeing is the grayed out ones were, were options that didn't advance to the sort of second round. Um, so we've emphasized again the community school, the civic school, and the academic school. Academic being the, the modernization addition and community and civic, the new buildings. So you see some of the design principles that uh, we use to, to help uh, evaluate each of these schemes and also the design criteria. So again, you know, does it have a heart of the school? Is it flexible and adaptable? Does it you know, foster this continuum of education? Does it foster active community use and safe routes to school? How does it deal with the, the program? Uh, outdoor athletic space, you know, what are the life cycle costs we think associated with it? Um, does it meet the sustainable design goals? Um, and what are the constructability factors and phasing and cost impacts you know, relative to that? So 
So uh, just to quickly, you know, go down here, um, you know, the community school, I mean, it scores pretty highly, as, as you can see. Um, you know, we, we thought that we should ding it somewhere, you know, so um, uh, may, that maybe the continuum of education, you know, it's, it's a little remote from UVA, uh, VT, that, you know, that's sort of struggling to find something. Um, in some ways. So uh, again, it scores pretty highly on, on all the things. It fulfills the ed spec, um, you know, it, it could be quite sustainable, it could create all those sort of 21st century learning principles. And likewise, the civic school, um, you know, scores pretty highly, uh, you know, against these criteria as well. Um, the, the primary challenge in, in the civic school, again, is focused on that phasing uh, implication, that it does, in fact, sit in the footprint of a portion of the existing building. So as Andrea said, there are solutions to work around that, um, but uh, you know, it's uh, largely hinging on those kinds of uh, issues of, you know, between the two options. They have different presences and things like that. The academic school, again, you can see it, it has more challenges. I mean, the challenges were built, uh, you know, inherently into it, you know, particularly with the program accommodation. Um, so it was designed, you know, to reduce the program uh, uh, aspect. So it, the scores were lowly there. Um, the flexibility is, is, you know, it's it's kind of constrained in its configuration and, you know, the integration of the buildings, you know, will will landlock it to some extent. Um, and again, the program isn't quite as optimally configured generally throughout um, as, as you could clearly do in, in the new construction. So the life cycle costs are associated with that. We have the existing building that has a certain building envelope. We can enhance that envelope to try and get better energy performance and other issues out of it, but it'll still have certain compromises uh, you know, built into it and that the phasing is, is uh, more complicated. Um, that said, you know, Fairfax builds buildings like this all the time. You know, so Langley High School, uh, Oakland High School are, are gonna go through the same kind of phased uh, 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 modernization. So these are then finally the, the options that rose to the second round. Uh, just to reiterate, the community school uh, you know, built back uh, adjacent to Marion Henderson, straight outside of us. Uh, Civic here, which you know again put the sort of gyms and theaters here at the end of the axis, and the academic school, as as we said, putting the, the academic wing here on Route Seven and integrating with some of the existing architecture. Uh, this this is just some data on the schools, but actually all this information is repeated later, except for the parking counts. As Sean said, so we're actually averaging around 340 and to 350 spaces uh, per option. So uh, now we'll get into schedule and cost. So looking at the schedule, the everything above the gray bar is the information uh, that was developed for the RFP in terms of the length of time to uh, have architects and engineers draw the building, the amount of time needed for permitting, and then construction. So two years and four months allotted, allotted for the school construction. So that means for you that rising fifth graders will be ninth graders in a brand new complete school if that helps to put it into perspective for your own children so then and that's with the new construction option so now if you look at the information below that line this is for those three options and how much time it takes to do the building in the athletic fields that's that first line so there's a comparison of brand new construction some overlay with the civic school, and then the real renovation, which is one year longer. So if we go renovation, that means rising fourth graders begin ninth grade in the new school. And then all have five to six months to develop the other lands, well, to get it prepared for development. Um, there you go. Okay, so then we were looking at cost, and we worked with Davis Construction, uh, who'd actually been involved in, with some of the um, previous uh, studies that looked at the site. So the construction cost over here for the three options, and this is why we provided lines on the handout so you could write down these uh, if you're interested. So the community school at 110 million, civic at 119, and academic at 103 million. And note that for the academic school, that does not include the $15 million 
that would be required to expand the athletic program in the future if chosen to do so. So the 103 it was without that future athletics expansion. So if you look at the three schools, um, that cost is broken down into several factors. I'll run through those quickly with you. So the bottom bar, the red line, is the cost to do the site work. So that varies between 10 to $14 million. That's a factor of the size of the site. That's why you're seeing that larger with the 14 million at the academic end. The next bar, that yellow bar, is the cost to uh, construct the fields, the softball, baseball, tennis, and multi-purpose. That's about five million. Then the orange bar that ranges about three million is for the demolition of the existing building. Um, there's a lot of work involved with that, so it's not a small task. Uh, and then the um, renovation cost, you're not seeing much, just 200,000, 400,000 with civic and community. For those two, that's really just tying the kitchens together and any kind of connection to the, to the middle school that's required. But in the academic option, that's about $8 million because we are salvaging a portion of that existing building. Then the next line that you see, it's zero here and ranges up to almost two million in academic is the phasing costs because we're going from no phasing required to multiple phases with possibly sub phases being required. Uh, we would also, um, that cost includes any need to have any modular trailers during construction. And then the cost of work. So the about $20 million, the cost of work is um, the bonds that are required for the contractor the uh, overhead and profit of the contractor, contingencies that are required, um, all those things that we need but don't aren't physical materials or guy swinging a hammer. Um, and then lastly is the escalation, which ranges from five to six million dollars, and that right now we're anticipating escalation at about five percent per year for you know looking out to starting construction in the spring of 2019. So we wanted to take a moment to just talk a little bit about why the modernization cost is what it is. I think previous discussions had it at a lower figure than that. So when we modernize the existing building um, of George Mason, we can't just go in and say, okay, we're, we're, this is the ox gym and it's staying in ox gym and we're done, right? Because we're making other changes to the building. And when we do that, we're required, such as building an addition around it, we're required to bring it up to current code so that affects pretty much every system in that building. So it affects the um, mechanical system, sprinklers, electrical, and the fire alarm system, as well as we'd have to bring it up to meet current ADA standards, which it does not. Um, and uh, we'd have to uh, change the building envelope, so that's replacing the windows, putting a new roof on the building in order for us to have smaller sized mechanical systems, because that's more efficient to have those uh, new envelope. Uh, and then the mechanical plumbing and electrical systems would be sized to allow for that future athletics expansion. And then lastly, there is the renovation cost itself to actually move walls around or put new doors up and to make the existing building be comparable to the additions that would be 2020 construction. Uh, now, when we look at construction costs, it's, we have what's called the hard cost, which is building the building and con uh, doing the work to the site, but then we have the soft costs, so we wanted to give you further information on that. So what makes up the soft costs? There's the architects and the engineers design fee, I'm up here, which is about typically uh, 7 to 8% of the construction cost. Then there's the construction management fee at $2 million. Um, FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment at four million. What that means, if you took your building and you turned it upside down, everything, oh my goodness gracious, everything that fell would be FF&E. I'm like, I just hit that. Uh, and then permitting and utility fees, which is about $100,000. So when we add the hard cost plus the soft cost to those totals, um, we're looking at uh, the, the totals you see here, 124, 133, and 116. Um, and this gives you an idea of the, the uh, allotment for hard versus soft costs. So with those costs, we were also asked to look at ways to reduce cost, and this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of benchmarking. So there's several slides here that compare uh, our ed spec 
Falls Church, has, you know, Falls Church is at spec to other school systems in the region. So one of the recommendations that we had was to reduce the size of the building by 10 classrooms and those associated spaces, which could save possibly two and a half million dollars. And um, the graph you see here, here are the other school systems with their uh, capacities for their schools along the bottom, the square footage of the classrooms and the classrooms per student. The golden bars are the sizes of the classrooms. So Falls Church is sized well in terms of the classrooms at 800 square feet. But what we're not seeing uh, kind of comparable to the other school systems are the amount of classrooms per student. So at 1,200 students, we're at 0.038. At 1500, we're at 0.031, whereas the other school systems that we looked at really range between 0.023 and 0.027. So we saw that as an opportunity to reduce the classrooms. What that means is instead of a classroom being used five out of seven periods a day, it may be used six out of seven periods, which is an 85% utilization factor and is more comparable and uh, common in academic, uh, uh, other academic settings, not just the four we looked at, but lots of others as well. Um, let's see. So another thing we looked at was the size of the performing arts department. We thought there was probably about 2,500 square feet that could be cut from that portion of it, which results in about $700,000 um, uh, in savings. This was looking, this comparison chart is looking at the size of the theater compared to other school systems. So the, the bars are the amount of seats in the theater. Uh, we're at 750, and then the ratios are the amount of seats per student. So at 1,200 students, we're at 0.63. If we're looking at it as 1,500, we're at 0.5, which is comparable to DC, uh, but still somewhat higher than the other school systems in the area. So we have to just ask ourselves, how much of the student population do you want to be able to? Why are you to Dunbar in DC? What's that, sir? Why did you pick Dunbar in DC? That is not a comparable school to compare to. This is DC's ed spec. Fine, but you're still not making good comparisons. Okay, well we have, we're looking at DC, Arlington, Fairfax, and Montgomery. So we did look at multiple comparisons. Uh, the next piece that we looked at is the Ox Gym and the Athletic Department for, sorry, for savings. So each one of those we felt could save about a million dollars each. Um, the chart that you see here, the bar that's on the left in each of these is the overall square footage of the athletic department. The next one is the main gym size and the next is the aux gym size. So the main gym uh, square footage we felt was appropriate compared to other uh, school systems, but the aux gym was higher than the others at 9,000 square feet. So we said, well, what if we reduce that to 5,000, which is similar to Arlington and Montgomery. Um, as well as looking at the square footage per student. Uh, the, the 1,500 number fell off, sorry. 44 is at 1,200, 1,500 I think was about 35 or something like that for the square footage per student. So we felt that could be reduced. Uh, and then we looked at geothermal. I just wanna say this isn't something that we recommend to delete the geothermal system, but we did look at what that would mean in terms of the savings at 1.7. Um, and why we would not recommend that is because uh, some earlier estimates that were done by a different company were that the geothermal system payback would be in about eight to nine years, um, meaning that the, the uh, energy that you save from having to purchase could offset the cost of that system. So this is the current high school with new construction. This is the amount of energy uh, use intensity that it's reduced. And then going to geothermal, that amount reduces further. And then as we get more detailed, rooftop PV. Another thing that we looked at was uh, whether the athletic fields could be built uh, later on and not renovated right away. This could save between four and $10 million depending on the option. So for instance here, you know, you could look at, well, can we save the existing baseball fields and save tennis, but that would mean you're not building a new softball field. So there's trade-offs to this. Um, also, the other thing is that during construction, we were planning that they could stage the contractors' materials and trailers on the athletic field. So if we don't have that as an option, then we'd have to look at off-site 
uh, rental for possible staging or stage on site and look at off site parking since there are about 2,000 parking spaces in the uh, vicinity with UVA and the Metro. And this was the example of looking at the civic school as one phase. So you, you save about seven months time and you would save about one to two million dollars if it was built in one phase. Then there's discussion that I believe uh, after this presentation about the economic return from development, whether you're looking at it in terms of 10 acres or six acres. And this was a summary of the uh, possible cost savings that are available, uh, which I believe Wyatt Shields would be talking about as well. So this was a summary slide of those possible savings. And that was the three options. So uh, with that, I believe Wyatt Shields you're talking next. Well, good afternoon, or good morning still. Uh, my name's Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager for the City of Falls Church, and I think we promised uh, that the presentation piece would be over at about 10.30. And it's, uh, it's 10.30, so there's no time to talk about financing. So, uh, <laughs> um, so um, I, I'm gonna spend just a, a brief amount of time to talk about uh, financing, and uh, then Jim Snyder will stand up to, talk, to give you an update on the small area plan and the small area planning for this campus is very important in terms of uh, potentially generating uh, funds to help pay for the high school. That's been the concept really since the boundary adjustment was done uh, four years ago. So here are a couple of key factors. I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, the bottom line is uh, this is a very difficult uh, financing challenge for the city. Um, there will be nothing easy about this and there will be nothing normal about this. Uh, this is an extraordinary challenge for a city of about pop a population of about 14,000 people to take on a capital project of potentially $120 million for a school in addition to all the other investments and in capital that we need in the city. Um, if you liken it to climbing a mountain, uh, we're not taking a day hike out in the Blue Ridge Mountains. This is a major expedition and we need to be very purposeful about it. We need to be very strategic about it. And, and we are also going to have to have some faith um, as, as we go forward in the future of the city. Um, so just as a quick overview, uh, we currently have $51.2 million of total debt. About three-fourths of that is invested in our school facilities. About a quarter of that is in other general government facilities. And your tax bill today, and actually tax bills just went out, um, 16 cents on the city's tax rate goes to cover our debt service for that $51 million in total debt. That's about $6.2 million of our budget today. Now, if you take a look at the entire capital improvements program, uh, the school program that we've just discussed, which I'm putting at $120 million, um, sort of as a summary, just as a number to encapsulate what the presentation that Perkins Eastman just made, um, we have 32 million in other uh, projects. Um, the library at 8.7 million, City Hall at 11.5, that's the additional debt that would be issued for the City Hall project, and then 10.8 million in other projects, school and general government related. So a total of $152 million in debt in our five year CIP. So again, this is a, this is a major challenge for the city. Um, so what can the city afford? That's a very complex question. Um, in some respects, it's a simple question, but because of the economic development piece for the campus, that's what really makes it a little bit more complex. But there are standard uh, metrics that we use. These were discussed at the February 4th um, town hall meeting that we had on, on this project, and I'll run through those again just for people who might have missed that. But so you have your industry standards, but you also have what's really the, the kind of the key question for us locally is what's reasonable for our taxpayers to take on but if you take these uh, industry metrics uh, debt to assess value the city currently has four billion dollars of real estate value in the city so that's our tax base so currently our debt is about just over one percent of our assessed value so that's a that's a pretty healthy ratio this is the average for northern virginia if we execute the full capital improvements program, 
uh, we'll be right at our policy limit where our total debt will be 5% of our total assessed value. There are some jurisdictions that have exceeded that. The state law limit is 10%, uh, but we'd be outside of averages for the region. A debt service for expenditures, uh, we currently, um, that 6.2 million on debt service is uh, just over 7% of our annual budget. What's on average for Northern Virginia is just over 8% of, uh, of our local government budgets, if you include Arlington, Fairfax, all the other jurisdictions. But if we execute the full CIP, we'll be above 14% of our budget will go to debt service. Our policy limit is 12%. What this really is is a measure of resilience or flexibility in your budget. If you have a big share of your budget going to debt service, uh, you can't change that. That's an absolute obligation over which um, for 30 years uh, you'd have no control over. Uh, and then debt per capita, uh, this is uh, where we are today. Every man, woman, and child living in the city has just under $4,000 of debt uh, for the city. That's a little bit below average for Northern Virginia. But if we execute the full CIP, we'll be over $14,000 of debt for every man, woman, and child in the city. That's a big number. This is the mountain that we're, we're trying to climb here. So uh, in terms of the community school, how I arrived at that $120 million, as you saw, the community school is 110 in, soft, in hard costs, 13.8 in soft costs. I've taken 30% of the listed reductions, just as a working number. Uh, so you take six million out of that financing cost of 2.2 million so you have a total cost of 120 million that we'd be seeking to finance so if we assume uh, a 30-year term to the debt and we phase the issuance over four years of the construction then what that will generate is 7.5 million in annual debt service again we currently have about 6.2 million in our budget so we'd more than double our annual debt service for your average household in the city, uh, that's about a $1,200 increase in your annual tax bill for the homeowner of a $700,000 house. Um, you can call it 18 cents on the real estate tax rate, but the real number to look at is, this is kind of the immutable number. If there's no economic development, if we just played it straight and we tried to finance the, this uh, project with 30 year debt. Uh, so. Uh, Tax rates are a function of overall economy and things like that, but this is what you would see on your tax bill regardless of what the tax rate would need to be. Now, um, so the importance of the economic development piece, which Jim Snyder is going to present um, uh, after I sit down, is that we have always envisioned that through a land transaction plus through future tax yield, you could generate funds that would help offset the cost of the high school. Uh, the Urban Land Institute, which is a group of really smart uh, real estate uh, people, uh, they estimated that the, the future the development on that site could cover between 60 and 80 percent of the cost of the, of, of, to the taxpayer of, uh, of the high school. And, um, and that's a yes, uh, the 18 cents is for the full CIP, right? No, that's for the school that's itself. The school only. That's school only. That's right. Um, now, there's some challenges with that, with the economic development piece. You are relying on a third party to both make the transaction work and to bring the development online, so there's risk associated with that. And in any event, the tax yield will come on after the bonds are issued, so there is a financing gap. Um, we have underway right now a market evaluation study, which will sort of build off of what ULI did uh, and, a, and give us a evaluation report and also a roadmap on how to bring that land to market in a way that would maximize the value to the city and minimize our risk. We'll take our initial look at that next Friday with the Economic Working Group. And then right after that meeting, we'll be meeting with the Budget and Finance Committee. Karen Oliver is the chair of that committee. Um, to go through the, the debt service modeling for this project um, with the market valuation study in hand. So there are risks associated with this. Um, I think the, the uh, anytime you have that amount of debt, debt equals risk uh, for the city. Uh, but with the economic development piece of it, really the, uh, the ability to mitigate the cost to the taxpayer relates to market timing. There's no question that this land has value, and there's no question that it certainly can be developed. 
but there are market cycles. There is the possibility for delay, and if that happens, and, and that happens after we've issued the bonds, then uh, that's why it's really important to discuss this, this project just in terms of what the straight cost would be, because if the economic development is delayed, that is in fact what we'll be paying. So with that then, um, there will be time for Q&A afterwards, but I'd like to turn it over to Jim Snyder there, just for an update for the public on the status of the land use planning uh, for the campus site. If anyone has questions about this previous part and you want to write them down on an index card and raise your hand, we'll come around and collect them so that we have, we can be working on the answers while Mr. Snyder is presenting. Thank you, Vice Mayor and uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, I'm Jim Snyder, I'm Director of Planning and Development Services here in the city. I'd like to recognize Lindy Hockenberry, one of our planning commissioners who's here today. Uh, the Planning Commission has been working on this along with the staff and the City Council to develop small area plans for the city. And so looking back at the city, we have been doing planning work in areas identified as opportunity areas. And presently, we're looking at this area, the school site in the West End. We've done plans for the Washington Street Corridor and the West Broad Street Corridor. So this is part of a larger planning effort that is trying to bring economic development and better uses and modern facilities here to the city. Uh, we saw the site mentioned earlier. Again, it's a complex site in terms of we have a lot of neighbors, Fairfax County, Fairfax County, WMATA, I-66, but this is the new land brought into the city. Uh, we have been talking with uh, our neighbors, which include WMATA, Fairfax County, property owners about how development might occur. And so it's important to have partnerships and try to make these things work well. Metro, as you may know, is one of the economic drivers here in the community of the Washington, D.C. area. That's where money is going and that's where development wants to be. So we have the opportunity as a part of the boundary adjustment to use up to 30 percent of the property for economic development and that was part of the arrangement and agreement with Fairfax County that allowed the property to come back to the city. We're trying also to take a bigger look as planners at the whole western end. We have the WOD trail, we have commercial and industrial properties. We actually have a piece of ground that came to us, the property yard came back to the city, and of course the school site. So we're trying to look holistically at this area and see how will it all relate over time. Over the next several decades, we believe this area will redevelop, be improved, will add more value to the city. And the focus, of course, is going to be the transportation and accessibility to the metro and to the other transportation areas. So we think there is the ability to have high value here over time. Uh, there is a process and timeline. We started back in February uh, with meetings. We had a work session with the Planning Commission following a small area plan back in, in March. And here we are today, uh, part of a longer timeline. So I'll go through this really quickly. Over the summer, we hope to develop a draft plan that will integrate many of the concepts, the economics, the planning ideas, the school plans into a draft plan that then could be reviewed by the Planning Commission, the City Council, referred to boards and commissions in the fall, looking toward a bond issue in November, and then based on all of those results, trying to finalize the small area plan with future planning and zoning actions that would happen in 2018-2019. We had a stakeholders meeting following our first meeting to talk to all the partners and potential people who have an impact. There's a long list of things here these will all be on the web, so you can look at them in more detail. But to summarize, we have opportunities because the West Falls Church Metro Station has lost much of its traffic because of the opening of Silver Line to do more here. WMATA has uh, freed up parking areas. UBA Tech has potential for partnerships. And uh, so we're looking at trying to maximize those transportation uh, opportunities, educational opportunities and then working with property owners to see what can be done with the adjoining properties. There are some things immediately where VDOT is looking to create a flyover as part of the I-66 improvements to connect eastbound I-66 to the West Falls Church Metro garage area. The lack of usage of this station has now freed up a lot of parking so that Metro is looking to create a new kiss and ride location possibly on the north side of their garage. The parking areas may be able to be developed with better uses, and that half-baking garage may be able to be filled. So there's opportunity there. 
we talked to property owners, the buyer family, uh, the, the Federal Realty Investment Trust people, all of them were interested in partnerships. And of course, we have the WNOD Trail, which also provides another method of access. So lots of opportunities. One of the key concepts is how do we have economic development and an educational village? How do we create this agora that uh, synthesizes these variety of uses on the site? So this is a work in progress. The partnerships with UVA Tech are potential. So a lot of potential things we're going to work on. Uh, one of our consultants looked at uh, what could be done here, and this was an early idea of maybe an urban town center with uh, you know a green space and a variety of uses. At this point, looking at a high school location here. As we looked at this, uh, we asked and developed a, another idea, which you're seeing in some of the plans that uh, the architectural firm has shared. The idea of a promenade that would create building sites uh, with a green space that would be pedestrian and bicycle oriented that would lead to the educational area. In this case, showing the high school here. As this has evolved, we've thought about, well, what is a promenade? Well, some of you may have gone to Charlottesville University of Virginia. This is an example of a green space that coordinates and organizes space, pleasant place to be, a pleasant place to, to organize an educational facility. Uh, if you've been to Boston, the 100-foot right-of-way of the uh, Commonwealth Avenue is one of the organizing areas of that part of town. And here in the city, if you go to Whittier Park on Hillwood Avenue, you've got a 100-foot wide park. So if you want to visualize what a promenade might be in terms of space, go stand in the middle of that public park. The thought is that you could create blocks of development on either side of a pedestrian, bicycle, and green space that would lead to the campus. And this could be developed in a modular fashion where possibly even the early development could happen on the blocks that are closest to Haycock. Infrastructure and other uses could be here. These areas could be blocked off and used for community events. And you would have the activity of students going to and from school every day their first 800 feet towards home, because all housing is on this side of town, uh, would be activating this space. So trying to create a place for development, linking development and the educational facility with a great space that would have economic viability. Clearly, this will have to be tested in the marketplace, but it's an idea we're looking at in our work session with the Planning Commission and others that have some interest in pursuing this. We've tried to show how this might fit with the various options. These are the, some of the earlier sketches. Here you see you get smaller area. It's kind of an L shape. This is the community school two. This is the academic school. The space is about cut in half, so you have less you have less economic value that can contribute. And this is a third one, the civic school with, you know, again the the promenade and development blocks. Again, these are very sketchy. They're at the conceptual level. They'll need to be further developed and tested as part of the economic package. Uh, in terms of planning and zoning, the property was in Fairfax County. You heard the difficulties of getting height to build the gymnasium. We need to plan and zone it. It's presently zoned single family by default. We haven't planned it yet. We need to do that. There's a role for the planning commission, city council, the school board, and the community to decide what that should be. Clearly, though, we need to provide zoning and planning that will give us a world-class school and high-quality development that will be a, a, a a, a perfect uh, place for the community to uh, focus on in this end of, of Falls Church and be a complement to the school and an asset to the entire community. We're looking to create a long-term tax base, offset the cost of schools, and create a great place. At some point you have to do land use and zoning, so I got a little wonky here about here are some options. One of them is uh, we need to put some colors on the map. So, one idea is to develop a mix of public and business, representing the 30% that's permitted by the agreement with Fairfax County to be developed commercially. The second is to have public use with mixed use designation. And then a third might be a new land use category and zoning, and zoning category. Zoning options could be to rezone the property to B2, which allows development and allows public uses such as school buildings. And a second might be to develop a new zoning category and we probably have a committee that would take about a year to figure that out. This is one of those options, just looking at striping patterns, 30% business, 70% green space. This is showing the whole area is public, which it is, with a, a note saying that 30% could be mixed use, uh, the exact location to be determined. Again, these are general. This is the kind of things you do in plans. 
this whole thing might be a special planning district that would, you know, perhaps the development helps accrue to the value of the school and helps offset those bonds. Or a new category, a new color on the map, and a new special zoning district. So these are three options. They're not determined, but we'll need to make those decisions eventually. And that would follow the approval of the small area plan or the planning and zoning action by the Planning Commission and City Council. We have to notify Fairfax County, our neighbors, in Arlington County, those around us, of our intentions. So there's some, some involvement, at least opportunity for comment by those groups about our plans. So looking at next steps, uh, the small area plan, we're, we're here uh, today. We're gonna be, over the summer, integrating the school feasibility study, economic issues, working on transportation and urban design. We hope then to have a draft plan in the fall that can go to the Planning Commission, City Council, possibly be referred out to boards and commissions leading towards the November bond referendum. And then lastly, in 2017, late or early 2018, finalizing the small area plan with planning and zoning actions in 2018-2019. So uh, those are some of you know, the steps ahead. Happy to entertain questions. All of these presentations, I believe, are going to be on the city website. So I know we've gone through this quickly but they're all available, and those who are watching on TV, I think this is going to be put on Paul's TV, can look at this as well. So thank you very much. So now we're going to go into q and I ask you to indulge us a few more minutes. We have a whole chunk of questions here. So I'm just going to ask Dr. Noonan and Mr. Shields and others to come up and answer some of these questions that have come in. We've divided them into little groups. If we don't get to your question exactly, Feel free to um, come and ask us afterwards. So here's some questions on timing. What are the estimated time gap between construction of the school and economic development? And I think Genevieve has another microphone here. The, uh, the, the bonds would be issued and then um, the school needs to be constructed. That would take probably two years. So the gap is probably uh, two to two and a half years between taking on the obligation for the, for the debt for the school and having the economic development get under construction. An enrollment question. Well, at the time, the plan would be at the time that the, the debt is issued, that we would have a master developer under agreement with the city and with a form of payment as a, as a down payment on the land before we issue the bonds. That's the um, anticipated uh, sequence of actions. But we would not have, it is very likely that we would not have the full value of the land in our pockets at the time we issue the debt. If we structured it that way, there would be a pretty significant discount uh, because they would be giving us the money two and a half years before they can actually take possession of the property. This would be after the, excuse me, this would be after the referendum? Yes, this would all be, um, this would be about a year and a half after the referendum. So if you think of the sequence, if the referendum is approved, then we would go through a design period for the school, which would take about, uh, take about a year. Um, during that period of time, we'd finish up the zoning actions that Mr. Snyder mentioned um, and be marketing the property for a master developer so that at the time that we're ready for construction for the school and we issue the bonds for the school, we have that master developer under agreement with the city with at least an initial payment uh, for a uh, down payment for the future uh, rights to the land. And that land transaction could be structured as a lease or as a fee simple sale. We're going through the pros and cons of those right now. This is an enrollment question and I put up the enrollment graph so that we can help explain that. How certain are we in the enrollment projections? In the 70s there were 2,000 students and then we dropped down to about 1,100 students. I don't know if people know that there was actually a committee in the early 80s to convince families to move to Falls Church because our school system had shrunk so much. Uh, so how certain are, are, are we that we're going to keep expanding? And these are our enrollment projections here. Uh, it takes us to 2031 and the lower line projects a 2% increase, less than 2%, and the upper line presents, pr projects more than 2%. So it's telling us that by 
2031, 2032, we're expecting 1,368 kids. Uh, these projections come from the Weldon Cooper Center, and as we look at past projections and compare them to what who actually came, they're very close. They're within about 2%. So we are pretty confident that this is how it's going to look. Of course, because they're projections, we don't know if there's going to be a lot of people moving into town that we didn't expect or people moving out of town. So that's why we said a high school between 1,200 and 1,500 students flexible because we just really don't know for sure how many kids are going to come. capacity for the school? Well, it, in 14 years it says 1368, but we're building to a 1500 capacity. Right, so you are going to be over that capacity in, say, 20 years? We may be over that capacity in 20 years. Are you going to continue your policy of trying to discourage people with families coming into the city? No, we're <laughs> we have so many people with families coming into the city. And then someone else asked a very detailed question about enrollment and if we had 1250 or 1375. So if you really want a specific answer on that, come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's a couple questions on safety. Uh, people are concerned about having commercial development right next to the school and what that does for safety. Right now, people cut through the campus to get to the metro. We're in a really public spot. Kids also go over to Giant and uh, other places for lunch throughout the day. So what are we going to do? to make sure that the businesses that here are appropriate for schools and also the safety of the campus. I, I think one of the um, reasons that the community won, and I don't, I don't want to give too much deference to one of the um, plans versus another, but one of the really nice things about the community one site design is that between the school and between the development is a field with a couple of parking space, uh, parking spots. And that was one of the things that was attractive to the school board um, was it created in many ways that barrier. Um, we have, um, you know, we continue to keep safety and security people uh, alert and we ask our kids to stay alert. Um, and it's something that we will continue to work through with the community um, knowing that it's going to be a blended space. And I think it's going to be an education process for us and an education process for the community uh, mixed use, for potentially mixed use folks that are coming in as well. Um, but we do think that that option in particular because of the field buffer provides uh, a nice option for some separation. Here's a question on the demolition cost. Uh, as they were talking about cost, it was mentioned that the city was going to have to pay to demolish the school. And why isn't a developer paying to demolish the school? I think that's a great question. Uh, we could have the developer pay for the school uh, for the demolition. And so that's one sort of thing we'll look at in terms of the cost. I think one of the school options, we would have to co cover at least portion of the demolition because the new school is on top of the old school. Uh, but the majority of the demolition could just be part of the land transaction. The developer's responsible for that cost. And this and this particular um, model, this community school, would probably lend itself best to that sort of idea, too, because it would be completely separate from the existing structure. Here's a financing question. What happened to the $40 million from the sale of the water system? I don't think it was actually 40, right? The, the, land, the sale of the water system was for $40 million, uh, plus the boundary adjustment. Um, the, the way that that was structured, the city had liabilities uh, for the uh, water system and uh, so the net of the sale was 20 million. And so of those proceeds, 10 million was put into capital reserves and that's what our capital reserves are today. And, uh, and uh, about 9 million was put into the city's pension fund to, uh, to provide a perpetual return on equity for the taxpayers of the city as well as to protect the uh, pension fund. And then uh, approximately 1.2 million was spent for immediate improvements, including the turf field uh, that you uh, see outside and some other uh, more immediate capital needs. Is there an option available to raise property taxes so that we start construction with it higher and then it may go lower once the economic development kicks in? Uh, certainly, I mean, tax rates are set every year um, and so if, if there's a bump up in taxes and then as the, uh, as the debt service um, becomes a smaller share of the budget over time, then tax rates can go down. So when we talk about that 18 cents is what I, I noted for the school, that would be in the first years of the project. 
What tax incentives will be granted to commercial developers? Well, tax incentives, um, our, our mission here, our purpose is to raise funds to help pay for the school. And so typically you would do tax incentives um, to try to spur economic development to create jobs, particularly, and you see that across the state. Um, our, real, our purpose here is to try to generate revenue for the school. So while I wouldn't say it's impossible that there be tax incentives, I wouldn't say that that's really immediately up in front and center of what our playbook would be for this site. And why is the city determining the location of developable land versus an actual developer? Well, I think we got great development advice from the Urban Land Institute, which had a lot of representatives from the development community. And also when we tested this, I believe in the early PPAs, that area also was shown as a development area. Um, I think that's, the reality is locations need to be uh, together and they need to have access to main highways. You also need to keep the school land together as much as possible. So I think we do have the right development location and I think it's been validated by all the various studies that have been done. So this one says, please explain why we're talking about the school program with regard to rising student numbers. Why is the square foot cost what we're talking about versus what the students need? If I'm not asking that correctly, whoever wrote that down, feel free to clarify. Um, if students are encouraged to not depend on busing, what impact is expected to the students? All, all good questions. Um, not sure how I uh, necessarily can respond to the first one in terms of um, look, we are looking at the student program needs regarding the rising student numbers and that's part of the reason that we're trying to look at a greater um, size of school. Uh, why is the square foot cost uh, versus the student need the focus of design? Um, just FYI, um, we do these ed specifications um, that are updated on a routine basis that are based on the student needs um, and the changing program needs within the school. So those define then ultimately what the space is. So because the design was built on the ed spec that was provided that was determined by the needs of the school, I think that we are being reflective of student needs with respect to the design that's there. And then in terms of the uh, students, if they're encouraged to not depend on um, transport, busing transportation, what would the um, impact be? Uh, I, I think that um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what the impact would be, except that it would be longer walks for kids. Um, perhaps we can look at some safer routes, safe routes to school, which is part of what we have talked about uh, as well. Um, there's been some, uh, some movement around that here in the city. Um, we do, quite honestly, um, have a very uh, generous zone for busing, and it is something that perhaps we could look at, um, and it could even create some cost savings down the line uh, with respect to transportation, so something to look at operationally as well. Mr. Snyder. I just wanted to add even an additional context the city is working through the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission to consider bus rapid transit along Route 7. So that will provide additional bus capability that might be usable by the schools as opposed to requiring the schools to provide the transportation. That's one among many projects that are now out for uh, regional community and community input over the course of the summer through the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. So you'll be hearing a lot more uh, about uh, those potential projects that might have significant benefit to the city. Thank you. Another thing I thought of as we talked about this is that the students that are gonna be able to take advantage of this new high school are current, for the first time, are seventh graders, fourth graders through seventh graders. So they don't have a habit already of how they get to school. So we have four or five years to start to change those habits so that when those kids get to high school, if we do something different, they'll be ready for that. Families will be ready for that. Uh, this one is for Mr. Shields or Mr. Snyder. Is the economic strategy for financing the new high school only being analyzed with the potential future development on site and we're not including other development opportunities in the city or are we taking that into consideration? Uh, from a financing perspective, so far we've really just been looking at this site. 
in terms of yield, tax yield uh, generated on this site to help mitigate the cost of the school. Um, but from a planning perspective, we're taking a much broader look. Yes, and uh, I think I think longer term, as we you may have seen the slide showed the whole West End, you have contiguous acreage, which is already zoned, planned for business and industrial. And it's kind of bordered on the east by the WNOD trail. Uh, it's all within, you know, walking distance at some level or, or bus distance or bike distance of the metro. And so over the next decades, that area should be able to contribute an incredible amount of additional value to the city. I think it would be possible to consider putting, creating a business improvement district for the west end of town in terms of the commercial areas and, and use some of that to support the school, but also to make this whole part of town more accessible and connected to the metro. So while we only have 10 acres, the 10 acres could be a real catalyst to make another 30 acres bloom. And uh, you, know, you have the potential between the city property and the Federal Realty Investment Trust property and the property being assembled in the Gordon Road Triangle to have a, a limited number of owners. And so possibly a special taxing district could be looked at to help uh, this part of town uh, pay for itself and because of its preferred location. Again, that's, those are things decided by public officials, not by me. There are a few questions in here that are really specific about the school program. They're wondering about the, uh, how high school is going to change during the 21st century and there'll be more biotech and media studies and what will that do to the high school. There's another one about making sure that we have enough green space and that the middle school students, if their field disappears, they need to make sure we have green space. And there's another one about um, a performing arts center or shared spaces. They're all really specific to the school program, so I'm going to pass them on to Dr. Noonan. All, all really great questions. Um, one of the things that we are committed to in these designs, these sort of conceptual ideas that are up there now, is to kind of, um, as best we possibly can, create spaces as flexible as possible moving forward. Because we know that the academic program is going to change over time. Um, but the one thing that I mentioned in the very beginning was, you know, we need more spaces for um, for science and for technology. We need more flexible spaces for collaboration. Um, we need more spaces that are community spaces that could be um, the the performing arts centers and the like. So those are all, all the questions that have been raised are part of the conversations that we're having currently with Perkins Eastman. And when we get to the next phase and really start to design um, at a more concrete level of what those spaces are gonna look like are absolutely part of the conversation moving ahead. But the big idea is that we wanna create as flexible space as we possibly can so that we can modify, adapt, and um, move forward as needed into the future. And now there's a number of parking and transportation questions. Uh, what will be the net change in parking? Will commercial parking be an option after hours for events at schools? Traffic on Route 7 is already really difficult. How are we going to work with Metro on that? Uh, Metro, we don't know what they're going to do. Uh, that Metro station is underused now. If it becomes more used, are we working with Metro? And then someone else asked for a diagram of the bus and drop-off configuration. So I think that's kind of on there, and I'll ask Perkins Eastman to answer that one next. Um, I think the answer is yes, we are working with Metro. As uh, uh, Councilman Snyder mentioned, there is ongoing work on Route 7 for rapid bus transit. VDOT, as part of the 66 plan, is going to do a ramp, a uh, flyover ramp that will connect to that garage. Uh, the loss of activity at West Falls Church, I think, creates a, an opportunity for development to fill that space. And uh, the exact number of parking spaces, I'd, I'd, I'd have to defer to Perkins Eastman on that. But I would mention to people, uh, you know, we provide iPads for all the kids. And uh, parking spaces, particularly structured parking places, cost a lot of money. Uh, they can range from 15 to 30 to $40,000. You can buy an awful lot of bicycles for kids for the price of that. And that's actually transportation. Parking spaces are just, it's just dead storage. And if there's nothing in it, it's vacant dead storage. So if we thought more about the opportunity for kids to get themselves to school, providing them transportation, and maybe have a world-class bicycle uh, workshop for these kids to learn how to work on this stuff. There are ways to work this into the educational aspect, plus it's healthier. So um, I think that's important. We also are working with 
Uh, Nelson Nygaard, one of our transportation consultants, through what's called a transportation and land use connection grant to look at transportation. That's one of the reasons for the grids of streets. So it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, we are aware of these issues. We'll continue to work on them. Can you explain one of your sentences? You said that the underutilization of West Falls Church creates development opportunities. What, unpack that a little bit? Well, for example, Metro, uh, they, all the parking used to be filled with cars, including the vacant lots now on, on UVA Tech. With Silver Line opening, all you have to do is go look. The garage is half empty. The spaces on the parking area are not being used. So with less traffic, less commuter traffic, that opens up areas for possible potential development. Certainly, whatever development happens on the city's 10 acres, you know, there's certainly capacity at that station which needs to be used. The vacant metro parking lots could have additional development. And of course, the UVA tech property is vastly underused. So it's a station that is, has capacity for more development uh, because of the, well, that would be Fairfax County. I think they have that area planned for residential. But all, I guess what I'm getting at is a station which is a lot less busy than it was. And so by adding development here and, and looking at these other opportunities, we can make that station more vital. And of course, activity at Metro helps pay the Metro bills, which the city contributes to. So I think it is, is a good, good thing for the city in the sense that we have an opportunity to improve that situation. Hey, Jim. I have a question. You mentioned a special taxing district over here, which I think is a great idea. And speaking of Silver Line, um, Fairfax County in the Tysons area added on the uh, Dulles Rail Tax onto the property tax bill as a way to offset the cost so the uh, homeowners didn't have to bear a lot of that burden. What are the options for a special taxing district, and at what point do we have to put that out there in the market before we decide to ask developers to bid on that site? Um, it's a bigger question. I, to some extent, defer to the manager, but there are special districts that can be created. There are business improvement districts which can be created when you have a more mature area. So I would I'd ask White Shields to comment on that. I think there are tools that can be used, but they'd have to be thought about and advertised and considered publicly. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And it would need to be done um, as part of the RF for the property so that the, the, the people buying the property would understand that there would be a special taxing district. But that could be part of an overall financing po uh, package, both for the infrastructure associated with redeveloping the site, but also specifically for the schools. Uh, yeah, uh, your characterization of the underutilization of West Falls Church is a little optimistic in the sense that late last year, Metro had a potential plan that would actually close the West Falls Church Metro during off hours, which I assume would affect economic development. At that time when I learned about it, none of my neighbors knew about it, and I called around, very few of the businesses knew about it, and I called into Falls Church, and very few people there knew about it. So my question is, you know, Paul Weidefeld has his obligations to uh, bring metro costs down. What are you doing to have an active representation to make sure that the plans for closing West Falls Church don't come back, which I assume would have a major impact on retail development? Um, well, very good question. Um, and metro is like an onion with a lot of skins on it. There are a lot of issues which we're all very much aware of, so we're trying to work through them. Um, I represent the city on the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, the council, and our city staff are very much involved in our policy making. The Northern Virginia Transportation Commission appoints the Virginia representatives to the Metro Board, so we're very much involved with Metro. We realize that, first of all, that you need to make it safe and reliable. We realize the long-term financial health simply has to be addressed and it has to be addressed by greater participation at the federal level, the state level, and the localities such as Falls Church are already contributing. Part and parcel of reducing the burden for additional financing is gonna be better use of the properties around Metro to feed people into Metro. So we think actually our plan not only would benefit us in terms of commercial development, but would benefit Metro in terms of producing the additional riders that now they don't have because basically it's an under, the, the point about underutilization is the station is basically currently surrounded by very low use uh, occupancies. On the Fairfax County side, it's some residences. 
on our side is the school. By developing commercially, uh, we can use that asset for our benefit because still to this day, despite Metro's problems, commercial developers want to be next to Metro. And at the same time, it'll help Metro by providing additional riders. And then if there's some special taxing district issues that came up a minute ago, we can look at that. But we are very much represented on all the metro issues, but we're one voice among many. Yeah, I understand, except when I was calling around, no one really knew about it. So I understand why this creates a benefit for metro. But this is sort of a political question. If you're going to make the, if you're going to make the assumptions here that there's going to be development, and if you're going to assume that metro is part of that development, then you have to take an active political stance to make sure that Metro is open so it's consistent with your development goals. And at least as of last year, when I was calling around and no one knew about this, that wasn't happening. So, you know, if you're gonna make these plans, I think it has to be very proactive with Metro, working with the folks at Fairfax County who were interested, you know, the various people who are on the WMATA board to make sure that the voices are heard because during that plan, there were times that the, the people who were screaming about it were on the Green Line. The Green Line stations were, that were gonna be closed, there was a lot of political activity over there. There was very little political activity on the Virginia side, it's a little bit more along the Silver Line, which was a great threat to uh, Fairfax County, but this but this plan is directly impacted by reductions of hours in West Falls Church. Well, I think your points are well taken. We've already had some initial high-level contacts with Metro and plan to pursue them, and I very much want to follow up with you uh, on more detail. You know, the saying goes, other places talk about whether we talk about transportation uh, in our region, and we're back at it again, but now back to the schools. But thanks for all those comments. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Snyder also would love to talk to you afterwards and give you further updates because he has some more information. Uh, one of the questions here is Perkins Eastman compared our school to surrounding schools, but this person is curious about how we compare to the Bull Run District schools that our students play against. Clark County, Madison County, Strasburg, Central Woodstock. So if you have elementary school students, you may not even know that our athletic competition is way out there in the Shenandoah Valley. And the reason Perkins Eastman did not look at those schools is because we were really looking at the ones that are in similar context to what we are, which is more urban, more dense population. All of those schools have lots and lots of land around them, so when they need to build, they have way a lot of space to do it. So they're not, from an architectural standpoint, a real comparison. All right, and there was a, hold on one sec. One more question that, hold on, hold on, was about how much money have we spent to date since this property came into Falls Church on all these consultants and plans? Uh, we've been at this for uh, four years now, as, as we've noted at the beginning of this meeting. And over that period of time, we spent a total of $700,000 on, uh, on the planning for this site. And that's a big number. Um, the majority of that was in the context of evaluating the unsolicited proposal that we received and then in the RFP process um, that was mentioned at the outside of this uh, meeting. That's where the majority of the money was spent. Uh, the Perkins Easton project, uh, was, that was a $56,000 contract, and we currently have outstanding uh, the Commercial Real Estate Advisory Services. That's a uh, $50,000 contract as well. Those are the two contracts that are pending right now. So, oh, okay. So as, as thank you. I'm wondering if anyone has looked at the Mosaic District model in terms of the development model, which seems to be very popular in spite of the fact that the metro is um, not even immediately accessible. Um, in terms of the, the creating like an Agora District, which would be, um, you know, we have a movie theater, um, you know, educational spaces, businesses that have great synergy. And, and if you look at what's happening in Mosaic, they're pulling businesses away from places like Tyson's, which if you study, if you study retail, um, uh, business that you you know we all know that the malls are are being impacted adversely and and it may be only a matter of time that Tyson's may see greater um, impact as well. A couple of thoughts. Jim Snyder probably could speak to this, but I'll just say a couple of things. One, uh, there's some great examples. Mosaic is one. I, I don't think this would be exactly like Mosaic, but it, um, th there's some good examples in the in the region. Um, a couple of uh, principles, though. We do think that 10 acres is qualitatively different than six acres. Um, that with that size of a development, you can really get those synergies 
and also some open space that can be real gathering points to make something very special. Uh, we also think that the universities could be a potential important uh, hook or engine for this site. And those conversations are ongoing right now and could be very exciting uh, for, the, for, the, for the region as a whole in terms of their vision for the future for the site as well. So those, uh, uh, that along with what might happen on the WMATA site, this is, a, this is a site that could develop into something um, that's, that's quite remarkable and quite positive. Uh, it all has to be done very well to interact well with the high school uh, campus. All right, Jim, if you want to ask you that. Before you speak, one person I forgot to introduce at the beginning is Dr. Kevin Clark, who is the assistant principal of the high school. So he's in there every day and has a really good sense. And also Miss Angela Weston is in the back. She's a uh, English teacher in the high school. So if anyone has questions about what's happening in the school every day, those are the two people to talk to. Hi, thank, thanks everybody for coming. This means a lot to us who work every day in the school and appreciate the community input here. Um, and this is sort of a question for Wyatt too. Can you describe what you anticipate as the impact on the tax rate as a result of the commercial development down the line? You described the 18 cents, $12,000 on the, or $1,200 on the yearly tax rate. What, what do you anticipate that impact of the development uh, to that? The, um so uh, we right now I'm sort of taking the cue off of the ULI study uh, with the big important point for everybody to know that we're currently doing more work on this area. Uh, but uh, what the ULI result, you know, what they found was 60 to 80 percent of the impact uh, could be mitigated through the economic development. And so if you're talking about $1,200 on the tax bill, um, uh, cut that in half or, or, or a little bit more than half is, is the, uh, the potential uh, impact for the, for the development. There's much more to come on that and on uh, Monday uh, the, uh, at work session with the council and the school board on the 19th we'll have a more uh, full opinion from our independent advisor, this one of the, the consultant that I just mentioned uh, to help fill out uh, that information from an independent perspective. So give it the back and then we'll come forward. Yeah, is there any way you could put up the diagram of the school that, um, of the last school that was talked about? I forget the name. No, not the academic, after the academic. Oh, yep, this one, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the footprint of the school. And that's what we're, we're talking about here is the footprint of the school. Um, whether we're talking about this one or the other ones, and this one is the one I, I happen to like. Um, where is the vision of the school of the future, the 21st century school? These are very traditional footprints, but when I go to high schools and other places, they have engineering areas that are outside. They have media areas. I mean, they've got big areas that are kind of dedicated to 20, some of the 21st century skills. Are we just kind of creating a footprint and hoping we can create these spaces, or are we building in kind of the vision of what the school will be for the future and, and building that into the footprint now. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, and I can start. You or you start, start or I, from an architectural standpoint, we're laying the groundwork for everything that you've talked about. I mean, the ideas of learning happens everywhere is, is you know, part of what we're trying to achieve in each of these options. So that's both inside the building um, and when you think about the architecture of a school, about 30% of a building can be circulation. And so, you know, we're trying to activate that as learning space, as Dr. Newton said, as extended learning environments, you know, social spaces. Um, so creating these ideas of the heart of the school as sort of all community spaces, but that would also scale down into what we call academic neighborhoods as well, that um, you know, integrate perhaps interdisciplinary environments where learning can spill out of the formal spaces, the labs, the classrooms, um, into extended learning spaces that are activating that 30% of the building for project-based learning, um, you know, more active learning. But we'd also imagine and, and really desire um, that you know, that same sort of spilling out happens in outside as well. So I think those opportunities you know, manifest themselves in, in different ways and different diagrams. 
Um, here, there's a large plaza in front of the building, you know, that you can imagine that. Um, we've got a ton of space between the two buildings, too. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the academic wing could spill back, you know, into that sort of courtyard and create a courtyard. And so those ideas of courtyards manifest themselves in, in a couple of different diagrams here as well. So totally on board with that outdoor space is not just fields, so uh, that it's, it's, a, it's a learning opportunity and we should have all those great resources too. But Dr. Nina. Yeah. I, I don't have a whole lot to add to um, that really great answer, but I would say um, one of the values that we saw in this modernization scheme versus the other modernization scheme is that there's a new academic bar in there and because there's the new academic bar, the potential for flexibility in space within that would allow us to build on some of those 21st century ideas that we've talked about. Um, Any time we do a modernization or a renovation, um, I, think, I think you do become limited though. And I think that's maybe more to your question, is does this allow us the flexibility or does it limit us within the scope of what we're trying to accomplish? And I think as uh, of the two models that were presented in terms of modernization, this one gives us the most flexibility because it's got a very large space in the middle, it's got the new academic bar, and the two commons areas are pretty, are pretty large with the, uh, the front portion as well. Um, it's, it is a complicated um, space though, to, to be perfectly honest, from a flow perspective uh, and trying to figure out where, uh, where are good connections between, one of, the, one of the ideas that we wanted to make sure we accomplished in these designs, as I understand it, is making sure that there was a strong connection between Mary Ellen Henderson and George Mason High School and this of, of the models is one of the least connected, although they look like they're close in the front, um, the way around is, is quite, um, quite complicated. Sorry, I heard a conversation in the audience about that the middle space here is the loading dock, and that's why the renovation scheme we feel is least successful compared to the others, uh, because that is a loading space that's there. Whereas if you look at the comparison, pointer for this okay now i'm holding too many things okay uh in the community school there is a beautiful courtyard space that's created that space is very different than the space that's there um the loading dock the community it's on the back side yeah. it's the yeah. current loading dock it's then. the current loading dock so it's away from the extended learning spaces outdoors that sean was describing You have another question in the back? Go ahead. So one of the concerns uh, in the community is the cost. And so you're, you're presenting the, the cost of the hard cost of the different options. But I didn't see um, a projected operating cost because, you know, I think it's 86% of the budget, um, the school budget is uh, the staff and the teachers. So when I saw the projections of students, do you also have projections of the teachers that we're going to need to hire to teach the students and then the operating costs projected on top of that. Um, so just, that was my question. I didn't see that slide. Uh, it's a great question and it is anticipated that, you know, as more students come in, we are gonna have to have more teachers, which does rise, raise the operating costs. Um, I haven't yet had an opportunity being so new to really dig into what those additional operating costs are. If we're looking at say 1,360 students in 2030, what does that look like in terms of staff um, not only at the high school, but what are the overall um, operating costs moving forward uh, for pre-K-12. Um, but, but you're right, um, I would anticipate that it could be um, anywhere from 2 to 3% or more uh, per year. So it's something that we're going to continue to look at. Okay. Sorry, I had oh, a question. We're gonna it's 11.25. We're going to have to wrap up. There's a couple people with their hands raised. Mr. Lemoyne up front, too, has been waiting. Go ahead. Real quick. So... You, uh, Dr. Noon, you brought up branding as the, when you talked to you know, the, the school and the community, you mentioned that the brand of Falls Church is the schools, right? It's very important. How are you looking at branding the school? We talk a lot about engineering and the technical side and the science labs. And then you have the Commons the Performing Arts Center, potentially a Performing Arts Center, which I think would be a, a big plus for the community, which is lacking between Arlington and Tyson's Corner area with the new development coming in. I think there's synergies that we could build between those, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the brand of the new school combined with the new development, and maybe that's on the 
you know, the the uh, the, Fair, the uh, Falls Church uh, city side. Yeah, I, um, it, it's very early in my tenure here to be able to respond to what is the brand going to be, um, other than what I already know that it is, which is one of the highest quality educational programs in the world. Actually, when we look at comparisons between International School of Bangkok and we look at um, Jakarta School, International School, and we look at other comparable schools, we compare very favorably to schools all over the world. So my anticipation moving forward is one, to really become clear as we're moving ahead, what are we really good at? And one of the things we're really good at is providing a, a strong, integrated, cross-disciplinary program that hits um, the needs of all of our kids. Um, do I anticipate that we're going to land on being a humanity school or a STEM school or this school or that school? I think at this moment in time, it's a little too early to tell. Um, I'm, I'm always a fan of looking at a very broad interdisciplinary sort of liberal arts opportunity in education for kids with strands that also then can allow students to extend and enrich in areas that they are strong in. So I think being able to have sort of a both and is going to be important in terms of our branding so that regardless of what your path is, whether it's career and or college readiness, which means the same thing in terms of outcomes for students at the high school level, our students will leave ready. Um, I also think there are some other components to thinking about as we're sort of to your point is if in the economic development plan we're able to bring in a large tech company that may have a significant driver on how we organize our science programs or our engineering programs or our math programs as well to be able to integrate with um, that particular new economic development. Um, and then what happens with Virginia Tech and University of Virginia and, and what is the synergy there and how might we be able to organize with them around some ideas as well. So it's a long answer, um, but the short answer is uh, I would see the brand as a high quality education for every student that walks through our doors, regardless of whether you want a strong humanities program or a strong STEM program. Um, we're going to be able to meet your needs with some strong foundations in, an, in a building that is designed to meet those needs as well. Okay, we got one question in the back and one question right here. So my question is just really understanding the green space that's all off to the side of it, because the numbers and the projections seem to correlate the amount of usage of the green space with the high school student population, but presumably all of these fields are also middle school fields. And I don't know how this layout compares to what's currently here or understand how that actually, because it seemed to me two baseball fields, for example, and most of these are baseball and softball. So if you could just explain a little bit about how that fits in with the entire vision. Sure. Um, the Part of the reason that w the, the options progressed was to really articulate the fields better and, and make sure that um, they weren't overlapping, as, as you saw in one of the first uh, iterations in the field school, for example. Um, so recognizing that you know, they're really actively used both by the school and the community, so to optimize the, the complement of fields that were requested in the ed spec which is similar to what's out there today. Um, the difference being is that the uh, tennis program is also expanded, so you can hold competitions on six courts versus uh, I think the four that are there right now. Um, that said, they're, they're distributed a little bit differently, but not that differently than uh, they are in current configuration. So we have softball, baseball, multi-purpose. Uh, the stadium is the stadium that's there, you know, that was recently uh, reinvested in, so we, we're not uh, reconfiguring that other than some of the ways that the building might better relate to it. So, um, so that said, I mean, it's, it's a very similar complement you know, to what you have, um, but you know, perhaps uh, enhanced you know, through the reinvestment in the fields as well uh, you know, through the course of the project. And then with respect to just the or operational usage of the space, which I think is maybe a little bit more refined, um, is that with so long as we don't lose the, um, the practice field, I think we're in really good shape for both Mary Ellen Henderson and George Mason with respect to outdoor space for PE programs and the like. And one last question right here. I'd like to follow up on the question. I think you're the, you, you're the assistant superintendent. Assistant principal, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, the, you, ask, you ask about the revenue from, from development and how much that could offset, I think. Um, we got some data from uh, from Mr. Shields, 
and it ties into my earlier question about the whole phasing of the financing, which frankly I, I'm, I'm very confused on still because Mr. Shields went through it very rapidly. And my, uh, let me pose it this way. If the referendum is passed and we choose one of these, uh, one of these options, how soon and what is, the, uh, what is the range of time could we expect the, the estimated, what is it, 50 to 80 percent of the revenue to be offset by development? How soon could we expect that full revenue stream to, to come on stream? And, and are we taking into account the possibility of a, of a recession? Because it seems to me that's eight to 10 years out at, at a minimum. Uh, and, and just as a, I'm sorry to take up more time here, but I'm very disappointed that we have, this is a very good presentation in terms of the, of, of the, uh, uh, the, the architectural view of, of the school, but I'm, I'm very disappointed that we have not had a discussion on the financing and the development associated with financing as a separate piece Bef uh, in a town hall before uh, before making decisions on this process. There's going to be a lot more on the financing, and so tonight's I mean today's show, today's uh, meeting really is about these options, and now we've got to really dig into the financing. But before the decisions are made, that's and they and that will be done before the decisions are made. The um, and just in terms of the debt phasing, as is conceived right now, it would be. 10, 50, 50, 10. So 10 million in FY18, 50 million in 19, 50 million in 20, 10 million in 21. That's in the sort of the most accelerated uh, schedule for, for the school. So then how that shows up on the tax rate, uh, we will be recommending that we front load the increase in taxes to help smooth out the peak and build up the city's reserves before all the debt service comes in. If you front load those tax increases and bring the revenue in early, you result in a lower um, effective tax rate as you go through the project. But these are details that we need to work through um, and, and that's really coming up beginning on at the work session on the 19th. We've got a lot of work to do uh, to sort of present uh, some options for the city council and the school board and then really to get that out in a much more public venue to, to describe that. And with that, we're going to end the questions. If we didn't get to your question, all these people up here are able to answer them. So come on up and ask follow-up questions. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank FCC TV, Genevieve's right here, for videotaping this. This is going to be uh, available on our YouTube channel very soon. So please tell your friends and neighbors to take a look at it so they can be as educated as you are. And enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Hopefully we'll see you at the Tinner Hill Festival. Oh, one more thing, the girls lacrosse team was ahead at halftime 10-9. <laughs>